what she has to say. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting of the Lewis and Planning Board to order. My name is Lucy Bisson and I'm the chair of the board. And I'd ask Christine Kittredge to call the roll, please. Roger Dupre. Here. Joshua Najin. Here. Michael Marcotte. Present. Lucy Bisson. Here. Myself, Christine Kittredge, and Alexander Pine. Here. Okay. And because Amy Smith is not here, Alex is going to be a voting member this evening. Okay. And for sta city staff, we have Shelley Norton, Deputy Director, City Planner, and Craig Tebow, the City Planner. Okay, so where the heck is my agenda? All right, uh, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? No, we don't. And correspondence? Uh, I see that we got the minutes for mm. the last, the July 10th meeting. Yeah, we did we not, I didn't see the email go out on Friday, right? It did not. Okay, all right. It did not. Yeah, so, so I think what we're going to do is when we get to it, we'll just uh, postpone them till yeah. next because they're quite long to be able to read yes, them <laughs> and correct them. And I also noticed that we have a new um, planning document that you're going to explain to us. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to public hearings. First public hearing is Aegean Development LLC has submitted an application for construction of a 17,982 square foot apartment building with 150 dwelling units on a 30,548 square foot parcel located at 55 Middle Street. And Ms. Norton, could you please give us your, and tell us what the difference is between yes. this yep. one and the last one, please. Absolutely. So um, this project is uh, 150 new dwelling units in one building located on a parcel that's a little bit under an acre in size. Um, it will be a six-story building. The first floor will have a 1,500 square foot retail or restaurant space um, and services for the residents. There will be apartments as well on the first floor. And then the top five floors will all be apartments. Um, this is located in the Centreville Zoning District, so there is a parking requirement of uh, 0.75 spaces per dwelling unit, and then no requirement for parking for commercial uses. So they require 113 parking spaces. The applicant is proposing to use the adjacent parking garage, which has 590 spaces to accommodate their need. Um, there is a recommended condition um, for approval that there be something in place that guarantees the ability of the apartment building to have those spaces in the parking garage. Um, also related to access for the parking garage, there is um, intent to use the north side of the parking garage to use the entrance there um, and that requires access over city property. So it's also noted that there would need to be an easement developed for their access that way. Um, that's uh, something that is not something the planning board would grant. It's something the city council would grant. So that's just noted as well that that would need to happen. Um, as far as traffic goes, because the PEX building um, on Main Street has uh, is no longer in use but had a number of um, trips that were being generated and the applicant owns that facility as well. They're opting to take the credit for that building to put towards this project. So future development of the PEX building might require traffic mitigation, um, but this project will not because of that. Um, the Applicant has provided elevations um, from the two streets as well as from the Chapel um, Street dead end, uh, and they, generally speaking, meet the design criteria. Um, there are a couple of waivers that they're asking for that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I did want to point out for the board, and we've talked a little bit with the applicant about this, um, that the Riverfront Island Master Plan intent is to have the um, riverfront trail 
which is located to the left side of the image that's on the screen of the parking garage. And there's city property adjacent to the river to the left um, top corner. Um, so it would go through the alley along the left side of, of the parking garage, um, through city property, and then there would need to be an easement that would connect it to Middle Street um, to run along the building. So that's a discussion uh, the city, I think, has had a little bit with the applicant, but the hope would be that we'd be able to develop that um, with them in time. So I just want to point that out so you're aware, since you were so involved with the, the master plan, that that is an area here that, that we're looking to develop the, um, the trail to extend it further. Um, okay, so there, <laughs> because there have been a couple different drawings and iterations, um, I just wanted to clarify that um, originally the applicant was showing work along Middle Street that would include on-street parking, bump outs and street trees and um, new pavement. And their property line um, really is just outside of where their building footprint is shown. So pretty much all of those improvements are in the city right of way. And in discussion with the applicant and with Public Works, at this point in time, um, the decision was made to not show those improvements and that the applicant would work with the city if they deemed that they needed to dig up the sidewalk and needed to dig up that area during construction, um, that they would work with Public Works to develop whatever the design would be to put that back. Um, the way our ordinance is written, we don't have a requirement that they would do street trees if they're opting to have their building close to their um, property line. So um, that's kind of come out of the design at this point. So what uh, the engineer will be showing you this evening is a little bit different than what you had in your package in terms of street treatment. Um, the rest of the site, what's on their parcel is, is really unchanged, um, it, but it's really the treatment of, of the public area on Middle Street that's different. Okay, um, so the applicant will run through what they're asking for for waiver requests, but just um, to summarize, the first one has to do with entrance frequency along Middle Street for a commercial uh, mixed-use building. And as I had mentioned, the first floor is not um, straight commercial and it's not straight residential. You'll see when they show you the floor plan that kind of roughly half of it is commercial and the other half is residential. So some of these waiver requests have to do with the oddity of that. Um, so it would be unusual for you to have street entrances that go right into someone's apartment. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of why that request is being asked for. And then um, there is uh, another request that has to do with where the first floor um, elevation for the residence is, is located and they can run through that. And I have um, more detail in the staff report about that. They do have a waiver request for planting in the right of way for street trees. Um, I guess I'll let the applicant address whether they still are asking for that waiver tonight or not um, based on the changes to the design. And then um, regarding our uh, additional standards for um, certain residential units, um, we have the amenity area requirement. They're asking for a bit of relief from that. Um, they have actually, because of how we've written that section, it's only outdoor areas that count towards it. So their indoor fitness area um, technically doesn't count towards it. If you counted it, they really wouldn't need the waiver request. So um, that's a, a waiver that they're asking for. And then finally, I just wanted to say, so what I've updated in the staff review, um, they, on Friday, they provided the plat plan, so we had originally not had that in the submittal. Um, there is a little discussion back and forth. They're gonna end up needing to get a surveyor to stamp it before it's, it's finalized and submit, um, you know, submit it to the Registry of Deeds. Um, so that has been updated. Um, they, by removing the streetscape, that really addresses a concern Public Works had had. Um, and then I've made a few changes to conditions of approval. Um, number one and number two are reworded so that they are accurate to today's information. And then there's a new number three 
um, which is just an addition, um, which has to do with the subdivision plot to make sure that it's uh, stamped by a surveyor. So one, two, and three are, are different. Three is an addition, um, and, and those are what are suggested for conditions. Okay. Um, anyone on the board have any questions for staff at this time? Roger. Shelley, is there a city mandate or requirement or restriction as far as the height of a building um, down in Sonneville? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, they're within it, but let me just pull up what it is uh, for your own curiosity here, just a moment. So um, we have a minimum height of 20 feet and a maximum of 120, uh, I'm sorry, 150. 150 feet? Yeah, yep, 150. So they're doing a six-story building. Um, so they're probably about 75 or 80. I can pull up the, the drawing for that, but they're certainly within the 20 and 150 range that they have to be. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Cox? Shelly, yeah. do you know when there is planned investment from Public Works on Middle Street? The I area don't. Discussion? Um, and I know that the applicant has had quite a bit of discussion with Public Works about some of the things that they're interested in moving forward. Um, the applicant has some interest in seeing utilities go underground. There's been discussion about the feasibility and the cost with CMP for that. Um, so I don't know, though, when the intention would be to, to do improvements there. If I'd thought to look, I would have looked at our capital improvement plan that usually lays out yeah. this year and next. Yeah. But I know, I know it is an area, um, this project is raising it as an area of interest, certainly. Um, but some of it, there'll be some questions like that, one that really need to be resolved before anything could happen, because that really impacts whether you are going to have street trees or how tall or where are they going to be located. Well, and it even aligns with Riverfront Island Master Plan. Like if mm. we're looking at Island Point and investments and that, then we're going to yeah. have to match those from a public works perspective, even including that which you do with the easement that's been requested. Mm -hmm. Right. Mr. Pine? Um, could you clarify the placement of the trail on the drawing that we're seeing up on the screen just to make sure that I'm I'm visualizing this correctly. No, I'm happy to. That's a great question. A general swing with the mouse? <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and what I might actually do is sure. pull up the city um, GIS as well. But um, as far as from what you can see here, it would be coming around the building. And then ideally, kind of at some point here, we would, we would get over to Middle Street here. Um, so we would want bike kind of access as well as mm -hmm. pedestrian. But I can also uh, not behind and underneath where the label is by chance. Sorry, that's okay. No, I think looking at it from a topography standpoint will be helpful. So, so for here, there's a couple of options. One, which is maybe less realistic, is that there would be a bridge built across, <laughs> and then we would, and then it would, you know, kind of connect to this is the city parcel right here. Um, so if we could have a bridge that would come over that would connect to the city property and then the trail would continue around. And this, this parcel right here is where the building is going that I've just highlighted. Can you click the so, parcel behind it? That's the that's the, the power station. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so the alternative, which is more it would be more feasible um, or, or easier, would be to come up around Main Street and then go up Chapel Street Alley. And then we would have the city's like kind of pocket park here. Um, and then it would come around the parking garage and then there would be that access to get essentially onto Middle Street. I know it's not in our purview to talk easements, but it seems like if uh, you know there's a trade for access to the parking garage from the north end plus sort of seems and then also it's a nice amenity I would imagine the applicant is probably very enthusiastic about the trail so um, that doesn't seem like a big sticking point yeah yeah it, it does make sense um, certainly that mm -hmm. at the time of the, the one easement maybe both will get discussed but. is there going to be any work done 
I guess this is more of a question for the applicant. I'll save it for later. Oh, uh, Mr. Najin? I just have a quick question about, um, and I know that Dave is not here, so we might have a hole in answering it, but in the FERC relicensing <laughs> process, have we asked for any type of easement behind the, uh, the substation at all? Um, have we asked for any type of access to, um, to the riverfront? And also, is there a sewer easement back there? or any type of, uh, of city services that allow us access through that space. Uh, the reason why I'm asking yeah. this is because I'm more curious about the trail sticking closer to the water than going pushing mm -hmm. up to, to um, Middle Street, but. Yeah, um, we can certainly get that information for you at the next meeting. It's you know not salient to this conversation necessarily. It may be, depending on if we ask them for an easement, so. Oh, uh-huh. Um, all right, well, I'll make a note of that and we'll we'll get an answer for you. Um, I know that at this point they're working on, like, the recreation study is a year out at this point. So, I mean, I don't think they're very far along as, as far as, like, answers to what we might actually gotcha. um, yeah. end up having for a result of that. And just to be clear, FERC relicensing is for the hydro facility, which is owned by Brookfield and that substation is a CMP property so it would be a separate entity just to clarify it for the record right has nothing to do with this project or each other I think was Alex's point right yeah, yeah. right absolutely okay any other questions for for staff I've got one okay. uh, which is um, and I feel free to hold the answer because I think the applicant might get to a little bit of this but realistically my question is for staff about the design standards because it's the second time that we've reviewed a waiver request on entrance frequency and it's in line with a previous request that we've received and waived um, and so I I'd like to revisit that ask after we hear the applicant just from uh, what we're learning about the design standards as well as the specific waiver okay anything else all right in that case i will uh ask that you in, uh identify yourselves uh people from from the group and tell us your name and where you're from and speak into the microphone as this is being recorded and it would be nice if we could hear you clearly for the minutes hello hi uh, uh, for the record, my name is uh, Caleb Brass. I'm a project manager from Goral Palmer. Uh, I'm here with Nick Griffin, project architect from Cube 3 Architects. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, it's great to be here this evening. Uh, we're very excited about this project. I know we've already had some pretty good discussion on things that are, you know, talking about the future of what could be for this whole neighborhood. Um, so that's, you know, that's really, we share the same excitement in that, in that regard here too. Um, we have, um, you know, members of the um, ownership uh, client team here as well, applicant team um, that can address any questions if, if need be. But uh, for the most part, uh, Nick and I will be kind of uh, running this uh, presentation for you. Um, so Shelly did a great job just kind of summarizing where we've been over the past few weeks and kind of working with staff on, um, on this project and really kind of refining the scope. and in a way that will really work best for you know the future needs um, of this uh, of this area obviously the river walks are a really big part of that um, for our purposes I'll, I'll just kind of run through and and share with you some of the plans and really what has changed as they were talking about bump out street parking things like that so um, I'm gonna just kind of run through the next slide so just an overview uh, what uh, Shelly had kind of run through as well uh, I'll note, I, forgive me for the, uh, the typo on here, so the partial tax map is actually map 206 lot 1, uh, not 201, and that's actually, that's already reflected in the uh, application materials itself as, as lot 1, but uh, location is 55 Middle Street, um, as you had seen there on the aerial, and, and previously it's bound by Chapel, Lowell, Middle Streets, and then uh, to the rear by the, uh, the CMP property. Zoning Centerville District and the Design District Overlay. Uh, Nick will touch on some of the, uh, the uh, architectural standards for those as well. Um, the existing use uh, is currently a surface parking lot um, with uh, primarily open space through the discontinued portion of the north end of Chapel Street. So that remains um, you know, as kind of a roadway access for CMP to get to their property as well. Um, our full scope here, uh, mixed use development uh, with 150 units and a small commercial uh, aspect on the ground floor space there. 
with uh, plenty of uh, amenities for the tenants of the building. Um, so we're excited about that and it can t touch on some of those pieces as well. Uh, parking will be provided in the existing Chapel Street parking garage that has space for uh, 590 spaces in that garage and uh, happy to ans answer any more questions on that. I know we had provided some information um, talking about current capacity and you know properties allocated to it such as the PEX building now. Um, permitting requirements for this, uh, we are just before you looking for the, uh, the major development review. Uh, no other uh, permit requirements for the time being from um, Department of Environmental Protection or uh, Transportation at this time. Um, and then so just kind of really laying down the dates here, uh, permitting timeline we had submitted for our uh, and had our pre-app meeting June 16th, uh, tried to kind of get in early with staff before the holidays there, really got uh, kind of hit the ground running and uh, submitted our application July 14th. Um, since that time, we've had staff comments a couple different rounds and really tried to kind of work quickly to get those things back in for staff. Uh, it's a thoroughly review. And um, here we are today with, uh, with this board meeting here. So um, I have these uh, kind of aerial views, uh, much of what you already know if you're familiar with this site. Uh, so just in red, what we have kind of shown gives you the really good context where, you know, we really are right kind of in the middle of it here. Um, has a lot of connectivity to the downtown, uh, to the, the hospital next door, next door, excuse me. Uh, here's just a, a more zoomed in 500 foot scale um, looking in that really kind of gives you the context of the existing site here. I'll admit this uh, just from Google Earth, this aerial is a little bit outdated. It shows that small building at the top of the, uh, uh, just or just below uh, the, uh, the property there across the street in that parking lot there. Uh, but generally everything else will remain the same other than the, uh, the CMP substation as well. Oh, it doesn't seem like that one wants to, that one wants to load. So that one was generally just the same site plan uh, overlaid on that aerial to give you a little bit more context here. But uh, the next few slides are going to be just our site plan, grading plan, utility plan, landscape plan that uh, kind of runs through each of these standards and how things start to fit in here. Um, and then uh, beyond those slides, uh, we have uh, some architectural uh, uh, elevations and floor plans that Nick can talk about a little bit more about as well. Uh, so here's the site plan here, kind of generally shows the shape of the building, how it's laid out on the lot. Uh, in the Centerville district, there are no uh, front setbacks here, so we're really trying to maximize this space on the lot. Uh, of course, we're really maintaining through the uh, old Chapel Street way. Uh, we're maintaining that access for CMP, and then also to the north side of the garage, where we have the kind of bottom level, we call the river walk uh, level of the, uh, of the parking garage there. Uh, we are going to do some improvements to provide ADA access from the garage, which is kind of shown on the left-hand side of the screen in the, uh, in the uh, gray boxes there that are kind of labeled as ramp. Um, and that's going to give a good access from the ground level uh, over to the main entrances for the uh, commercial retail space and then the main lobby there. Um, generally, we're providing a little bit more space, a little bit more greenery just around the edges and specifically uh, against the building um, on the west side, kind of facing the river there. Um, one, to uh, give us a little bit more space for some of our utilities, but also just to kind of really start to set things up um, for, uh, you know, any kind of future plans for this building and give it a little bit more room to breathe as there's going to be a little bit more traffic uh, coming in for folks parking through the garage that's, that side. Uh, but generally, um, we've left, um, as Shelly had mentioned, um, we had some other plans that, uh, you know, discussed some other and and thought about some other improvements, but what we're looking at now, uh, we've pulled back on that in coordination with staff uh, to just really we'll repave the, the sidewalk around the exterior of the, uh, of the building here. There are some small spaces. We have a, kind of a range of about three to one and a half feet of space kind of around the perimeter of the building. So you see kind of on the Lowell Street side on the bottom of the building, uh, plan view. There's a little bit of green space there. And so what we're showing now is somewhat of a kind of curved garden bed um, idea through there, but generally, you know, that space is a good spot for, you know, things like planter beds, anything that can be kind of dressed up and, um, um, you know, kind of added in and out um, as needed along the, that edge of the building, provides a little bit of separation for those ground floor uh, resi residential units as well. Uh, along the rear side, we're actually, uh, we're going to be providing, um, you know, kind of 360 access around the building, so we have a ramp system that uh, that uh, gives access from the Middle Street side if someone so chooses down to um, the, the Chapel Street side there. 
uh, but it also gives access for, for folks to the courtyard area and then what we have for rear uh, stair towers uh, on the building that, that give access to those upper floors. Uh, here's just a look at the uh, grade change. And so what we can talk about a little bit more as I, at, at the end of this, I'll kind of jump through some of the, uh, the waivers and what we had talked about there. But, you know, there really is a, a little bit of topography across this site. I say a little bit, but it's closer to uh, about 10 feet or so. A lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. Uh, in my world, I've seen a lot more. But um, so for, for this here, um, you know, we've, we're picking up... Uh, Drainage on the site now um, really is kind of uncontrolled. There's one existing catch basin that's in the Chapel Street uh, portion or the discontinued portion, I should say. Um, everything gets picked up and makes its way a short way to the river, and, which is kind of barely shown in that top left corner of the plan view there. Uh, but in the um, proposed condition, um, you know, everything will have a flat roof on the top. Everything's going to be picked up in roof leaders. Uh, in the courtyard areas, we have a couple field inlets in there uh, that can dress, get dressed up a little bit, and those will get picked up and reroute around the side of the building. Um, around the, uh, the front of the building, um, just by uh, leaving that as, as is through there, we'll just maintain everything through uh, the perimeter of the site around Middle and Lowell Streets as well. So we're not really changing too much other than the addition of the building, just the whole grading kind of scheme and where, where water wants to flow to uh, on the site. Uh, we did request a waiver from the Public Works Director just to discharge directly to the Androscoggin River, which is pretty typical just for um, this kind of a project, which is uh, adjacent to the river and wants to uh, let all that water out quickly and not control it on site. Um, for the uh, for the utilities on this uh, plan, uh, we've got great access to utilities all the way around. Um, we've got, um, uh, we'll connect to the water uh, right from the Lowell Street side. You can see there's a kind of, I'll use the cursor here, there's a small MEP room that we have planned for the time being uh, where we'll have our, our domestics uh, water in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be very stupid. What's MEP stand for? Uh, it's a mechanical uh, space for the building where there, there could be, uh, you know, several different functions in there. Sorry. Okay, no problem. <laughs> also, what's BOH? Back house. Same thing, kind oh, of sure. just yep. building, okay. building support spaces, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so generally here, uh, we're obviously, we're keeping everything uh, underground and there's an effort. Uh, we're talking with staff at the moment and then a lot of other utility providers to uh, relocate uh, some of these uh, overhead wires that are around the site uh, to go underground. And so uh, we've made good efforts on, on that piece. And so uh, generally what you see here in a black line that's kind of running through Lowell Street will be um, the general alignment for a lot of the uh, newer lines that get put underground. CMP actually already has their own duct banks coming out of the substation, as you can imagine. So they have additional um, conduits in there where they can simply just pull new wire through. So um, their scope in the direct vicinity right through here through Chapel Street, Lowell Street is uh, fairly minimal. Um, other utilities that we have, we have a sewer that's going to be connecting into uh, the uh, sewer interceptor here to the north, uh, north side, northwest side of the building. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, we'll have some of these other, uh, we have a transformer pad that's shown in this uh, newer space, uh, landscape space to the west side of the building there. Uh, and here again, I touched on this a little bit when we got to the site plan, but um, this is what we're showing uh, for the time being here for, for landscaping. So we still have a couple of trees which are uh, matching to what the city standards trees are here, these two, um, just on the, uh, on the private side of the property. Uh, we'll have a little bit of screening uh, here just around the um, kind of back of house functions here, uh, transformer, and then also just you know, looking through that view towards the uh, CMP substation there. Um, but generally, there's, there's a lot of small little pockets around this building where there's a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, planter beds, things like that. And so I think that this can certainly get kind of livened up and uh, provide, you know, some good, um, although we're right up against the, the sidewalk, you know, just some good, you know, minor buffers that kind of give that, give a little bit of distance and context there. Just quick question. Sure. I'm assuming the uh, black dots down near the curb cut in the lower left, those are bike racks? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so we're providing four bike racks there. Uh, I believe, and Nick can talk a little bit to that more, uh, there may be some additional space inside the building for you know, internal use for residents as well. Uh, but per the code, uh, four bike racks were required. So that's what we're, or, or space for four bikes, I should say. So we're providing the, the two racks that can you know, serve up to two bikes uh, a piece there. Um, with that, 
Uh, I can turn it over. I'll hit the next slide. and You can go back to the minute. plan just real sure. quick. <clears throat> Thanks, Caleb. And again, my name is Nick Griffin from uh, Cube3 as the architect. So yeah, on the, the ground floor, as Caleb mentioned, the only real public area is that 1,500 square foot of retail commercial in the bottom left corner. Um, though with the residential amenity, we've split this ground floor really as a public-private. So the uh, whole left side encompassing that retail is our public, you know, our amenity space. So that would be lobby and leasing along the front with maybe a business center in the top right corner that opens up to that courtyard. And then we'd have our club space, fitness, and then again, potential bike, bike storage for the tenants indoors in that top left corner with some... Um, support space there with trash up on the left. We've kind of buried the stairs up along the back at the, each end of the U just to, to take up exterior space that's not, you know, units looking at the substation. Uh, but again, this, and because of the grade difference, this first floor steps down as you go to the left. So kind of midway it steps down, so there's extra height uh, internal to that retail and that amenity space. And then as you move up to the right, those units all have a kind of more standard height. Um, and when you go upstairs, it's really the right side of the building mirrored. It's a double order corridor that goes from stair around to stair with some back of house support spaces in the interior corners as long as your elevators. Um, so yeah, going around to the exterior elevations. So to design this building, you know, we get really excited with projects like this where there's not a lot of immediate context and we're kind of creating what that context will be. When we got brought in, we were looking at it more globally with what potential will be across the street, um, across Lowell Street and across Middle Street, looking at more of a master plan. So hopefully there's building two and three to come. Uh, but really the, the immediate context is a substation, surface parking, and a parking garage, um, which didn't give us a lot to work with, but the little bit greater being having the downtown, having these medical buildings, and having the river, which is our kind of something we really wanted to make sure we highlight. Um, and then lastly, just having these design guidelines is always nice to have, um, to know what the city is looking for. And we're not, our profession doesn't exist without some constraints, so we get excited to have some real thoughts to help. So that really helped us start. And the things we took from the context were the kind of monolithic aspect of some of these existing buildings, the medical office building, the all everywhere is patterning. So the PEC building, those the Dempsey Center, it's monolithic brick building, but it's all patterning with windows and fenestration. Um, and then lastly, it's kind of built over time. The hospital's uh, the biggest example, um, but any kind of urban area, and especially New England, all the buildings were built onto and added over time. So those are kind of the three aspects we wanted to bring into this building. Um, so this is the elevation along Little Street. As you can see, we highlighted, sorry, oh, sorry. No, highlighted the kind of base here. The left is where that amenity and retail space will be. And then we tried to break down the building, not um, drastically, but we tried to get some monolithic aspects of it, but also realizing that this is a building for 2023 and not like these. some of these buildings were 100 years ago designed. So we tried to use that same window patterning and then use some materials that are evocative of the brick um, that's in the area to help that same kind of monolithic feel. On the left, you have this big monolithic element that um, really forces you kind of left and, and right as you come up Chapel Street, trying to highlight the fact that the river is to your left and highlight the fact that Lowell Street is now going to be this new center of development up towards the hospital. We have this break in the center with a dark gray, and then we've used the tower, which kind of represents and kind of looks over to the tower at the nursing center, just a kitty corner across the street on the other side of the park. It highlights that kind of tower element. So this elevation is really about, again, forcing your direction where we want it with this new development, and then trying to respect the, the uh, context in both the language, the texture, and the massing. Uh, we've popped to the next elevation. This is looking back towards the garage a little bit, and, but again, more importantly, to the river. So we have this elevated kind of tower element that is the main corner you see when you'll come up Chapel Street or you'll come around from that river walk. And that, again, just forces you back out to the river and showing you what the important aspect is what we think in the, in the neighborhood. Good. About where will the garage hit on that, that elevation? That's a good question. It's probably just past where that, where that tower stops. So Sort of halfway through. Yeah, so about even with, yeah, a little bit before the end of that, that retail that space tower, there. Yeah. And then height-wise? Uh, that It's only about three stories, three and a half stories on that end, right. so it's probably halfway up this building as well. 
Gotcha. So that's why, you know, these kind of, um, that green is highlighting these uh, outdoor spaces that for the tenants to kind of look out, hopefully over that river. And then, you know, there's kind of gray, dark gray band, again, works for that horizontal element, hopefully again, pushing you out towards that river. Um, and then on the other side, if you go to the next, on the Mill Street, again, because this is back towards the, the kind of history of the area, we use that more monolithic, again, evocative of the brick and the window patterning um, with this elevation to really, again, force you kind of up and down the street, work with that corner as well as highlighting this ground plane a little bit just to reflect, knowing that there'll be a lot of kind of pedestrians coming through here with this river walk, so I wanted to have something that touched that um, pedestrian feel. You know, I can, some of the design guidelines that were really important here is, you know, making sure our window um, percentages are correct. So we have over 50% at the commercial spaces, over 25% at the residential areas. Uh, we don't have any blank walls that are over 15 feet by 15 feet. Um, canopies and protections at each of these entries. Um, that's kind of some of the big breaks. This again is about 70 feet tall at the middle street side. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, 70 feet at the uh, out the Chapel Street side, down to around 60 or so um, on the Middle Street side. So it averages out around 65 feet or so in height with the change of grade. Um, and then as materials, um, you know, we tried to use some masonry at the ground floor. Again, just as you're walking around, and, and the, the material you can actually look and feel um, and touch is durable and you know reminiscent of the area. And then on the upper floors, tried to use a series of paneling to help, again, give that texture that's evocative of the, the brick in the context, but is a, is a more modern um, material that helps us break the, the building down, but keep that texture versus just breaking things down with trim and all the kind of more colonial aspects of it. This is really a more the urban industrial surrounding way to, to break things down. And then you know bringing in some highlight, whether that's a metal panel or fiber cement, I do have some small samples with me if, if I can pass things around. Could you talk about the treatment next to the windows? In yeah, the gray that, would, yep, that would be a, a panel system that's similar to the surrounding, the dark gray. It would just be a lighter gray. And then in some of the, the window configurations, we can kind of work those into the window mullions. Other times it's kind of a separate, but that gives the kind of vertical break that helps give the rhythm just with the windows alone uh, to help give some texture to that, to that gray area. Similar to this green, you know, around the highlights the special place, and this is the outdoor space, and really gives that vertical element that helps bring the scale of that tower down. Those are act are those actually uh, balconies as opposed to the Juliet balconies? Those ones would plan to be full balconies. Okay. Yep. All right. That does count towards your uh, amenity outdoor. space. Perfect. That's helpful. So yeah, that's, that's generally you know, our ideas on the architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and again, happy to bounce back and, and talk okay. through and, and these plans just kind of mirror sure. these plans as well. So. Sure. Um, I'll open it up to the board. Does the board have any questions or comments for the applicant? Mr. Dupree. Question on the courtyard. Is that enclosed or is that open? It'll be open. Yeah, it'll be open the outside. So it's, there's kind of tight areas around either end where the stairs are. Uh, and there's some screening and plantings along the, the substation as well, that would the edge, but that would be all open and access. The way it is is because it's kind of enclosed in the way it feels, right, there's not gonna be a lot of people, I think, that don't live there coming into it. It feels like a very personable and very um, kind of intimate space. Nick, can you, um, I had a question about that. You mentioned plantings. There wasn't anything on the plan showing new plantings back there. Are you referring to existing materials? Yes, sorry, yep, the existing materials back there. Okay, anyone else have any questions or comments? I have a comment. Well, go ahead. No, I'm gonna no. revisit mine, it's okay, go nuts. Okay, um, one of our standards is that the first floor windows be 21 inches off the ground, how high? or how far off the ground if you go back to the elevation on Middle Street? It's for residential, right, that requirement? That's for res residential. I, you know, the, the office, I mean, the, the retail, I, that's fine. It's, it's, you know, as you said, there's going to be a lot of, hopefully, people on the trail. Yeah. And people are gonna be walking by these windows that are, look 
ground level. Right. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in an apartment that has windows that somebody's walking by and can see into my living room, my bedroom, without having to have heavy curtains or, you know. I mean, um, that's my concern, is that was one of the reasons that we had that in our design standards was for privacy for the people in the apartments. And, and this really, that first floor, that really is not addressed at all. I mean, it, it's really ground floor and anybody walking by, it, it's gonna cause some problems. I mean, we had some issue, we've had a lot of issues with Oak Park. I mean, I realize that's an elderly com complex and oh, us old people can be really pain in the ass. <laughs> but, you know, if you're gonna have people walking you know, uh, uh, all afternoon and they're having fun and they're yelling and they're, they're you know, a and people that are in their apartment and if I work, you know, at night and I'm trying to sleep, this is, you know, there's no, there's no buffering, there's no, there's no nothing. I mean, can you address how you're going to protect the privacy of your first floor tenants? Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to, I, I don't mean to be a, pain in the butt, but it, I, it, it's a concern of mine. I think it's a big concern. Well, and is your question, where is there a variance from the design standards of 21 inches on the residential? Right, on the middle street elevation. Right, yeah. He brings up, see, if you have that, that elevation, and that, that this elevation on Lowell Street, way over on, on this side here, yeah. it's, it's almost on, at level to the sidewalk. Is, what is the height? From ground level to the bottom. To the first, of the to the bottom of the window. What is the the height that you're you're planning? Yep, I mean, we, we don't have any of the dimensions, so I, I you know is it is it ten inches or is it twenty one? I mean you know we're are we <laughs> or or you know I mean is it is it eighteen or where we can you know that the variance three inches not so bad but. It, I, if I can, I, I, I can't speak to like whatever what we have for the for the height there from from the uh, from the windows, but you know I think generally what we were looking at, and you know there's a little bit, you know I think we can certainly look to do two things, which would be one, um, you know raise the raise the bottom of those windows up. I think certainly certainly fairly easily, and then additionally we also have that you know small sliver of space on the side of the building that. You know, maybe that could be another spot for some additional plantings or a small bed, something that can screen. provide the distance, give a little bit of screen, you know, put some small perennials, something that might be 36 inches high, it gives a little bit of that privacy um, and a little bit of a kind of growth to it that could, um, you know, give that separation and that privacy a little bit. Right. Yeah, and the current windows all are just above that 21 inches. The only one is at that corner we show okay. kind of a slide. So, so there. it is. Okay. Yep. I, yep. You know, there's no dimension, so it, yep. it's hard to tell what, what's what. Yep. And I think I love the, the plan. I think it's a, it's a great plan, and, and I was just that concerned. And I would like to see some kind of plantings. I mean, I realize there's not much space, but, you know, something, a perennial. Uh, I know you can't put a tree, but... a little something that grows uh, that that might help to buffer against the um, the people that are going to walk by okay yeah. uh, Shanna you had a, you had some questions yeah, yeah but let's look at the green space again yeah. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot more opportunity in there. I, I really kind of left it on, you can see just on the Lowell Street side, there's kind of a small notch in the building there. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a good point to really kind of break it up. And that's really where we're trying to overcome. Obviously, there's a step in the building, you know, towards the middle there um, where, where there is the break. So that's really where we're trying to kind of overcome all that grade and also provide uh, that planting space there. But I see no reason why we couldn't uh, extend a lot of that green space all the way, all the way around the building. Um, yeah, I just, I'd side. like to see that. Yeah. Uh, just, just to make a little bit of a buffer so that these people are not, you know, completely. I, I, just, I just want to jump in with a clarification. So okay. um, the standard is that the first floor elevation, so where you're walking, be 21 inches or three steps above the grade of the adjacent sidewalk, and that the first floor window sills be a minimum of 60 inches above the sidewalk grade. 
60? Yeah. And when I had asked the applicant how much they wanted to deviate, what they had emailed to me was that it would vary from 21 inches to zero inches based on the grade around Lowell Street and Middle Street. The lowest grade differential is zero inches uh, on the northeast corner of the building along Middle Street. So essentially, people walking in the apartment and people walking on the sidewalk are walking at the same level. So it's a full 21 inch right. variance, essentially. Right. Um, that they would have for those two apartments on Lowell Street. Right. Um, Which yeah. still makes the windowsill, even at the greatest 21 inch variance, hit at 39 inches from street level at the lowest point. Did I do my math right? I think so. Well, yeah, we would need the variance either way because it, it basically doesn't, yeah. the, the restrictions don't want residents at ground floor, but you know, we're not going to hit 60. We're not going to bring all the windows. Well, then you're just trying to fill them. Sure. You're probably so, not going to make poor choices on that. Um, so to that point, it is, uh, so some of this is we continue to reevaluate feedback on our design standards and try to make sure that they both do exactly what you said, which was a lovely opening. They're intended to tell developers, this is what we value, this is what's in keeping. Please go crazy within mm -hmm. this area of creativity. And... Um, and they should also be supportive of development. And so I just, uh, I just struggle the, with the we want to have it both ways of we're requiring non-glazing up to a certain point based on topography, and we want a high level of glazing as a total percent. And so it just, I know that we've been revisiting glazing, but there is some irony to say, great job getting all those windows in there and also reduce the amount of windows in there which is essentially the conversation that we're having. Um, so it's just, a, for us, a pin to put in the larger glazing conversation, particularly around first floor requirements, when that's a struggle with residential on the first floor. Um, and in the vein of that, so what is the, can you point out to me, gentlemen, on your graphic, the frequency waiver request in terms of like what the design standards say you would have for a frequency and what your waiver request is for entrances, be, in part because it will be the second waiver request that we've had, particularly for commercial space on first floor, and that is another space in which we're paying attention. So can you offer that to me? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what we're showing here, uh, generally planned, where you kind of see these are these small uh, boxes, boxes on the outside is generally what we had shown. Those are like wall-mounted lights, so those would generally be right above what you would have for an entrance. Um, so these would be considered, per the code, your, your primary entrance into the structure. Now we do have another entrance here with the uh, mechanical space uh, into that utility room. But generally, and as Nick had kind of discussed, what we're really trying to do here is you do want to provide that separation for all these ground floor units here. Uh, and, but at the same time, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting grades around here. So it makes it really hard to uh, provide all those entrances without stepping the building several times, which becomes um, you know, very infeasible very quickly, um, especially with, with a you know, kind of a building design such as this doing um, kind of the podium style as well. Yep. And you're in this image, your retail only has one entrance and exit. And so there's well, not... It's only 1,500 square feet. Yeah. Correct. Just the one... I'm talking about the yes. frequency. Our frequency right, right. design yeah, I realize that. Yeah. is on the exterior of the building. And so there is, there's only one on that Chapel Street side all the way at the back. That's correct. Which That's makes good two. sense from a commercial yeah. leasing standpoint. And right. I'm just trying to feed that back into our thinking around the frequency. Right. Right. Is that right? Correct. Shelly, what would have, uh, assuming that we don't require entrances into first floor apartments in a way that's not secure, uh, even just as we look at the commercial, what is the variance from the, from what would be the design standard towards what the requ requested waiver is? Yeah, so it's required every 75 feet. So if you only looked at the commercial area, they would meet that. Um, but from that second entrance um, to the corner of the building on the right side of the sheet. It's like roughly 120 feet. And it's really just the residential that we're waving? Primarily, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay, um, I did get a, a question from Amy, who one of our board members who couldn't make it this evening. And she had a question of how many of the 150 units will be ADA compliant? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it'll be, it's state regulated, so uh, I believe it's 5%. 5%? Uh, that, that'll be ADA accessible, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, 
Yes, Mr. Pine. Do we have a rendering of the backside of the building? I know, you know, it's abutting a substation, so like, you know, substation doesn't care. But I do wonder about traffic coming uh, from the neighborhoods behind, just sort of what view you have there. Also, too, I was sort of glancing uh, on street view, sort of looking at how it's going to show up behind the parking garage, you know, as you enter the city. Um, it's obviously a monumental building. Do you have sort of any sense of, like, you know, there's the powerhouse for the hydro station, like how high it will sit above that? Um, Did you so, say three stories? I'm sorry? Did you say there was three stories above the parking garage from that angle? The, I believe the parking, parking garage would be would be sunk. about three. We would be about three stories up from that. And although that is, you know, generally even a little bit taller than what you would see, um, you know, you're kind of, there's a couple different zones almost. You have like the main street section. And then as you're coming in from, from, um, from say Auburn there, you're looking, you know, kind of from the West. So there's kind of two sections there that you're that you're looking at i think that the building and generally obviously the topography as you're going up uh, lowell street really helps us out in that sense so there still will be generally kind of a layering um, mm -hmm. as you would see so you still would be able to see the hospital up above and yep. and some of those structures i really like the the treatment of having the door on sort of the the side where you're entering from the parking garage especially considering that the you know multi-use trail will run through there eventually one of the concerns I have, though, is with traffic flow around that corner, you're putting a lot of activity into one space. You have people pulling into the parking garage, the future trail. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any sort of, I know it, it's hard to plan for the future that we don't know yet. Um, but in terms of space, I, it would be helpful for me to at least see a little more about how that's all going to fit together. Um, it just in terms of, you know, you have the trail coming around, that's gonna be an entrance way to the property. I think, you know, it's a great amenity. You wanna show off the, the building from that perspective. And if it's sort of like, oh, it's uh, the on, you know, the entrance ramp for the parking garage is your gateway to this, this new development. Uh, it's just something to think about. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. And I think, I think, Yeah, so around the north side of the building, um, you know, I think that becomes kind of the uh, the back and forth you have, and you think about, you know, obviously the the building would, you know, greatly, uh, you know, benefit from, you know, any future plans for a river walk, but obviously we need to kind of plan for now. So, you know, first thing that comes to mind with with your comment on that would be, you know, um, signage um, striping could be very creative. And, um, you know, generally around this area, you kind of have this change in grade as well that I, I think naturally people are already starting to slow down around that area. And I don't think you would see, um, you know, generally where you have, there's a, there's a small stair tower. I'll switch back to the site plan here. So I'll point out, so there's an existing stair tower right here. So generally, uh, you know, most folks will probably either walk up through here or come out kind of around the north side, I, I wish. I wish that this one would load because that would <laughs> help out a little bit more. Just go just, back and sit there. For just a showing a little bit just more. Need a second to load the. Yeah, uh, but generally, so what I was just showing previously, where the stair tower is there, we're we're showing just kind of a new paint, painted crosswalk, um, going across that side. Yeah, I'll just flip back. Maybe to try it. So, try zooming out on that slide. It, it might just be. be that you have a little. Nope. <laughs> yeah, it could just it could just be the quality because there's an aerial in there, so it kind of yeah. becomes a little bit large for a for a PDF. Mm -hmm. So, but at any rate, so what we're providing for the time being now um, is still um, we're doing kind of the city standard striping uh, for the for a crosswalk to provide folks coming from the stair tower and up through the ramp um, over to this section. So all pedestrians, everybody that's going to be you know for right now using this section here, I would say. Um, you know, they're going to be right front face as cars are entering that area. So I think that gives me a little bit of comfort knowing that we're directing people right to that, that front yep. section there. So not necessarily walking around from the corner of the garage where you won't be able to see them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will certainly be helpful. Uh, but then in a future condition where you really are promoting, you know, say a river walk or something like that, I think that, you know, that would be um, kind of a design, uh, a design thought I would think. There. Yeah. Sure. And we yeah. And we have two, there's two vehicle parking spaces there on the curbside. Yep. Is that the plan? Um, are those required by the city, Shelley? Thanks. So. Um, the the, the two vehicle spaces right there? Uh, so we, the 
113 parking spaces can be provided anywhere in the vicinity, so there's no requirement that there be anything on the street. They're, they've stated they're providing it all in the parking garage. Gotcha. I, I would, well, I'll listen to your comments first. <laughs> I've had this conversation with myself privately and other people about a hundred times. So yes. So just a little uh, background I, on the garage. Excuse and, me. Would you identify? So I, I, we know who you are. Uh, right? yeah, <laughs> but no. for the record. Just for the record. Okay. Just no, for the record. No, Jason Levesque, uh, owner of Aegean Development Corporation. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us the time. I should have said that. I got excited when you talked about the parking garage, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> So right now it's a 590 space parking garage that is literally completely empty. Uh, so what we're doing is we're taking cars or parking spots off of this area. So hence reducing overall traffic from what it was when it was actively the Allo Bean Call Center, which is one of our goals. Uh, this, these par this parking for this building, as well as building two with 180 units, which you have yet to see in two months, you'll see that maybe. And then that those spaces will be in the garage as well. I'm allocating in the garage and it will be deeded as a condition of permit um, at least one space per unit. But the spaces will be split between the, the river walk level, which is kind of below grade, and the first level. And then the other building will be further back. And what you can't see here, and you might know from experience, is that the main entry for the above two and a half, three stories is actually further down on Chapel Street. Right, yeah, right about there. Mm -hmm. Right about there. Uh, to address your view shed question, this lends itself, the garage lends itself well because it does slope down. It's less obtrusive from that side of the building, which is really nice. And it's also a little below grade. The topography works in our advantage at this point. Can you keep it on this view for a second? Don't touch it. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You a quick question. question. Well, just in the vein of, of parking and flow, which Alex was naming a concern of, the not the pedestrian flow, but the traffic flow mm -hmm. down Chapel Street that would extend past the parking garage and then turn right on Lowell in front of the building would be pretty minimal and purposeful. Right, and so there, and there really isn't a cause to be jamming past the property on Chapel Street, and so the amount of automobile traffic would really be limited to people doing business with the building. Actually, yes, and to take that just one step further, you can't if you're coming from Auburn, you can't take a left onto Chapel Street, mm -hmm. so that automatically pushes people up to Middle Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they're trying to do business with a building, they'll go up to Middle Street than down. I think the question for a future time and for everybody to think about, because um, I've thought about it, is the treatment you do to Lowell Street and the Lowell Street corridor, um, there is, in my mind, I'll say it now, an opportunity to develop a universal street, a one-nerf, a livable street, where cars are permissible but highly discouraged. You know, the chances of someone going up Lowell Street there's only, from the garage only if they're trying to go to Augusta. You know, or maybe downtown Lewiston. It's a right turn only on Chapel Street. Mm. So you're, it's going to be an interesting flow. But one thing we do know is that people will figure that out relatively. And if we can help change their habits and their pattern through thoughtful design, I think that's going to make this whole, this whole area an amenity, uh, especially with buried utilities and so forth, planters, bollards, and paints. And again, surface area on the street. So we are gonna to try to address the lower garage portion. And frankly, we don't need all the spaces there. We just need handicap accessible located there. That's gonna be critical. Right. Um, and then everything else will probably be just by human nature moved up a little bit. So that was my thoughts on the garage. Okay. So Great. I guess the, the request that I had, if we go back to the drawing that showed the two parking spaces street side, if there's a way, I know, I'm, I'm assuming that those are there maybe for the retail space for people just sort of stopping in for a second. It would still require, once you pull out, to pull into the garage and then pull back around. I, I would encourage you to think about that space like you were just speaking about the future for Lowell Street as a pedestrian space that happens to allow cars through it to go to the garage. I don't think I'm too worried about traffic flow that you were bringing up, Shanna. I, I, you know, only people who are going into the garage are going to use that. It's more about visibility and then sort of centering that space around the river walk, around people who are using the building um, and not making it someplace because, you know, people will still drive through there and you'll still have visibility issues going around the corner. So, mm -hmm. again, thinking about it as a space that's, you know, perhaps it's a different 
you know, since it won't be public street anymore, perhaps it's a different elevation slightly, perhaps the surface treatment's different so that, you know, it's more of a, a plaza space that cars can go through at a really slow speed. So yeah. just, just something that I'd encourage you to look at. And it sounds like you're already thinking that way already, maybe. but you know, maybe not in that area. And I think, although we can't predict what the future is gonna be, if you have a space like that and the trail just dumps into a pedestrian space, that's a lot better than trying to figure out, well, we have these travel lanes now, it's two-way traffic, how do we you know, shoehorn the trail in, how do we shoehorn in the ADA ramps, mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Um, and it could also provide additional green space uh, that could really complement the city's future plans for a pocket park around the corner. So making that sort of a greenway that goes around the corner of the garage, I mean, no offense, the garage isn't the prettiest parking garage there is in the world. Pretty ugly. Um, so, you know, giving people something nice to look at uh, in that area, I think, would be a wonderful amenity. So, and while you think about that, Chapel Street was discontinued and hence it's part of my parcel connecting. Um, there is no city easement save a sewer easement at this time. CMP has a 20 foot right of way easement going along discontinued Chapel Street out to their substation. It's the only entryway. So we do have a vested interest in working on mutual easements between Chapel Street discontinued as well as the city property. And because of that, I think we have a blank slate to really do some great design way beyond, I think, my skill set. And I would ask, you know, I don't think anyone ever asks a planning board for anything, frankly, um, that the work on this is timely on your master plan. It, mm. this, is, this is where it really happens. And I'd encourage it. And you've got willing partners and very smart, experienced people that are already conceptualized it as well. Okay. Mr. Najee? So just thinking about, you're saying Chapel Street Alley is now discontinued? Chapel Street, if you look to the, maybe zoom in, that part used to be a public way. Okay. So 30 the years ago. Still open. The alley is still city owned. Okay. Yes. So, but that is privately on I own the, that end of Chapel Street. And there are two or three structures on the other side of the parking garage. They tore one down. Okay. So well, we might be at two now, privately held. Okay. I think one's privately held and one's held by Brookfield. Okay. One of the things I'm thinking about is just as we develop uh, kind of a river walk plan, when you come up to that section, there's one, an opportunity um, for even retail um, along Chapel Street Alley against Peck's building, if, if so desired at some point. Um, and then when you come to that space, which is an underutilized uh, city lot at this point, that is actually open green space that could be definitely developed. But my thought is, when you come up to the back of that building, if there's no delineation, if we're pushing people up to Middle Street, um, people will still end up the substation. You know what I mean? It's just like that, because you're just naturally going to follow along uh, the, the course of the river. That's, that's, that's how I would function anyways. Um, and so coming back to the easement concepts, I don't know if we could actually get permission from like CMP, for instance. Like, in some way in order to push that river walk to the back of the property and not have people walking up against. Yeah, but this, is, this isn't part of this, this project. I mean, we, we need to discuss it, but not in, in it's view. part of setting up the entire area, though. You know, right, just, but it, it, you know, it, it, we can't consider it as part of giving them the, their development review. Yeah, I, I hear Okay, that. all right, I, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, anybody else have any Questions or comments? So just to, to clarify, you're looking for maybe some leadership from the planning board around our concepts for the river walk so that we can talk about it while this project's under development or or, or some sort of some sort I, of input there. Yeah, I mean from a from an efficiency standpoint. Mm -hmm. The power lines and there's an extensive jungle of overhead lines. Mm -hmm. They have to be buried or this project actually none of the projects could go. Mm -hmm. So during that major construction and bearing of utility lines, um, everything's being ripped up and then repaved. To me, from a development cost perspective, this is the time to visualize that. Mm -hmm. This is the time to design that because as Caleb has thoughtfully put forth, it's like, okay, let's put these in the middle of the street, um, which is important. They're, ice, they're identified, potentially identified in your plan. Uh, but now this is the time you're going to repave it. You have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, now's the time to. Yeah, and this time it. frame is, you know, to be quite frank, I, 
I think we would like pending approval, of course, and meeting all the, you know, the requirements and variances and so forth, uh, start work in the spring. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Is there anyone else? Shelly, is there any guidance that we can give? Because I, you know, it sounds like Riverfront Master Plan, that's going to take a really long time. There's going to need to be funding for the Riverwalk. That's going to take years. No, 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 you got that already. Oh. It was just announced. You'll have it a, a, uh, confirmed by Congress, 3.9 million in September. Sweet. Yeah. I think that's for um, the project in Simmer Payne Park. Yeah. Oh, the, so that's a specific. Just said, so, it just that said, was a river, specific it just said river walk. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Other yeah. section of the river. Yeah. But um, Alex, maybe you're looking to request another joint conversation with the city council. About there we go. Increased expenditures. I'm new to this. So yeah, maybe just we can make to this conversation this concisely about, right. okay. I think, that implementation matrix and how new information or funding yeah. might enforce that. Yeah, yeah. How, how we can encourage good development while we're still working on plans okay. to make it. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Um, okay. I, At this point, I'll open it up to the public. Uh, if you wish to speak, would you come to the podium? Give your name and your address, and you have three minutes to uh, speak for or against this project. Good evening. My name is Larry Pease. I live on Jermaine Street here in Lawston. Uh, I'm coming here to talk in behalf of this project. I think it's a great project. I think we need more of them in Lewiston. And uh, the only thing I had come up with a couple of questions is minor things, like, believe it or not, trash cans around the property so people don't just throw their trash down when they walk by. Um, the other thing is delivery access for the restaurant and all people moving in and out is there a location for them to do this on the site? A location for what? For, for trash? No, for uh, if I'm going to move into the project, I've got to have a place I can, my truck can back up, a delivery so, truck. So and specifically delivery, delivery parking spaces near the entrance to the building? Loading areas. Loading area. There's there we a go. loading area there. Okay. Uh, that's, what you're, that's what you're asking about. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go through all of your questions, and then we can let the applicant respond. Um, Sorry. And no. other than that is uh, exterior lights on the building. Are you going to have lights that are going to shine down around the property, or is it going to be done by uh, utility poles of some type, light oh, poles? They, they already, it says they have lights on the building that shoot down. Okay. They, I didn't know. That's right. why I'm asking the question. No, no, that's fine. And that's Anything it. else, Larry? No, that's it. Thank you. Can I clarify okay. something that I heard him Thank say? Thank you. Nope. Sorry. Mr. Pease, can I ask you a question? It sounded, I, I felt like I heard you asking about parking as it related to, I think you said restaurant. I don't know if you meant retail. Perhaps your retail will be a restaurant. But were you talking about parking and loading for both the residential and the commercial side? Correct. And the delivery of, when you said restaurant, I pictured food, but it might be retail and goods. But it, you were asking about both, just to clarify mm -hmm. that question. It's not just move-in day, but it's regular reoccurring use of the commercial mm -hmm. space for loading. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> so, um, Mr. P has asked about some trash receptacles. Since we're going to have, you know, the walking trail, and people are messy, uh, you know, is there has there any been any thought to putting a couple of receptacles. Uh, I know you have a trash room for the res residents. And then the other item that Mr. Pease was asking is for deliveries for that retail space or I'm moving in, where do I park my truck as I'm having my movers move me in? Is that, has there been that consideration? So if you would address e both of those items. Sure, absolutely. Um, I guess I'll start with the, I had the trash collection one here. So uh, we hadn't put much thought uh, to, you know, any exterior receptacles, although I don't think that's a, certainly a terrible idea. I think um, we certainly talk with, um, with the team here if, if that's something that certainly the board would like to see. Um, we can absolutely add something like that. Okay. Um, to the uh, delivery access and uh, people moving in, moving out, I think that's certainly, you know, a lot of the design here, um, you know, 
we have the two spaces along the west side of the building. Um, and that was really kind of the really intent for um, those two would be more for the service vehicles. Obviously, you have a trash room, there's got to be a trash truck. So, you know, once a week, someone will be showing up and will need to park. He'll need to bring out all the totes. Um, so that'll be for service vehicles. But I think, um, you know, certainly for, you know, residents as well, if people are moving in, moving out, um, those are on site. And so generally, I don't think at the, at the moment there will be really any, um, you know, kind of time restriction associated with it, but probably some signage that says something to the effect of service vehicles or, or certainly kind of tenant drop off, um, something like to that effect. Okay. On the near side of Lowell Street, there that whole side of Lowell Street is one hour parking currently. And so there, those signs will, will, after we pave back through the sidewalk, those signs will remain. Uh, the other side of Lowell doesn't have any, any parking at the moment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mr. Najee? Ah, Ms. Dittridge. I was just curious if I was going to, if I didn't live in the building but was going to the retail space, where was the parking envisioned for those customers? Uh, the parking would be, uh, you know, certainly right along Lowell Street in the okay. frontage there, um, or, you know, certainly maybe even within, within the parking garage. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Najee? So just one point on that, like, you know, considering whether or not there's space somewhere for some type of loading zone, including like in the discontinued Chapel Street Alley or Chapel Street area. Um, but I think I hear that the applicant is asking us um, um, for help in some of the street design aspect. Like basically, we're not talking about just this one project. We're talking about the possibility of uh, up to three buildings holding together like an entire section that's rebuilding a section of downtown so when we're looking at like the the waivers for the trees for instance um, part of that is repicturing how that space actually works in order to to make it more feasible to accomplish some of our goals with uh, both our comp plan and rim and then also for the project itself if i'm understanding that correctly okay yeah all right well we're still in open in in uh public comments so let's go on to is there anyone else that has any comments or questions regarding this project in the audience okay in that case I will close the public portion and bring it back now we can continue discussions mr. Dupre question you've got two parking lots on both sides of that building are you going to have crosswalks from the building to the parking lots uh, uh do you know, uh, can you point on the plan specifically which parking lots you mean? Well, you got Bottom of the page down. You got the one that's on between Lowell and the DHS building. Correct, down correct. Across the street from the building. Uh, Middle there, and those are some, some of the areas if we're able to talk about yes. some of those. Uh, you know, this, this area to the bottom is where the building number two would be planned that we've been discussing and then over on Middle Street as well would be uh, the site of the building number three. Um, currently, there already are crosswalks at the corner of Lowell and Middle on all four sections there. Uh, and we're providing a, a second uh, or a new crosswalk from the building one here to that garage and there's an existing one from um, just across Lowell Street from the uh, Chapel Street continuation. So I, I believe there's, there's fairly good uh, crosswalk access in this, in this small block. Well, Murphy's Law pertains to this because people are going to come in, park in that parking lot, and they will walk straight across to that building. So mm -hmm. there should be some sort of a crosswalk between that parking lot and the entrance to the building. I see one on the corner of Lowell Street yeah, and Chapel say. Street. Not, uh, not the one that crosses Chapel Street, but the one that crosses Lowell at the corner? Correct. Does that speak to your question, Roger? No, I'm talking about you, somebody's going to come in to that parking lot. You want to see it in the center? Right. I want to mm -hmm. see it in the center where it's going to be to the entrance of that building. Mm -hmm. So people are not going to, and you know people are not going to walk to that corner to go across to that parking lot. They're going to mm -hmm. go right straight across. Oh, that is that is a private lot, right? To not. Yeah, it's it, not it, a very big. A it is a private street. lot. I think what I could add, what I could add to that a little bit more, and, and I think it actually kind of goes in um, to uh, the discussion we were just previously having about parking, and you know, I think uh, for the first 
for starters as well, uh, there was additional uh, parking supply on both Middle and Chapel Streets that, that we had, I had missed to discuss here, but um, you know, directly what's seen on the plan, there is one hour parking right in front of the, uh, the Lowell Street uh, um, near side to the building there. Um, generally though, I mean, I think we talk about you know, this, this vision of you know, um, bringing in things like a river walk or you know completing all this you know in the future the the thought is that once all you know this building or several others are built that you know there's not even going to be really a need for any more parking other than for the actual tenants themselves and in, in that garage itself um, per the code you know in a lot of the codes you know everywhere it's going towards you know less and less parking in these in these downtown areas and so you know i think the thought is that by providing you know this idea of say a river walk or you know complete street anything like that you know it's really kind of discouraging that vehicular access even though there will be some I would say um, and then additionally you know the the best part about these mixed use developments is that they feed off of each other so everybody you know that could be a coffee shop and somebody would come down from you know on their way out to work they're walking up the block and you know most of that will will ultimately become foot traffic um, to the crosswalk at crosswalk access um, a lot of the times I, I think what I'd like to uh, I always note is that uh, I can't remember what the study was but generally the rule of thumb in my head is that you know they say people aren't going to walk more than like 300 feet to a crosswalk before they decide themselves just across the street and in this sense here this is actually a really small block on Lowell Street and it's actually a little bit less than 200 feet itself um, I think that paired with the location of those entries at the corner of Chapel and Lowell really kind of direct people to that to that crosswalk that's at the corner there. Um, I, I, I ultimately I, I understand where you're coming from. But those are kind of the, the thoughts that you know we were looking at you know in that that decision there. Right. Just, just to clarify though to Roger's question, this is a private. Parking, Correct. So it wouldn't be something that the tenants would be allowed to park in anyways. Correct. Because that's, know, a, that's or a user of the. It's coming to visit me. I have an apartment there. Right, but they. they come to visit me. Where are they going to park? In the garage. Park in that parking lot there, or they're going to park in that parking lot there. When they walk across the street, they're going to be a direct access to that route. That, I entryway. I understand that. I just think I mean they shouldn't be parking there because it's a private lot. And to be clear, those both of those parking lots are being redeveloped at some point in the near future. So, if we were to put a crosswalk in, it would be there for a year, two years, yeah. if that. Mr. Najin. So I just have a couple of questions about, this actually is probably directed towards staff. Is there currently no OC catchment um, in that area right now? It, it's probably what, like 60 acres of, of, of pavement that dumps into like one drain? I'm just wondering like how, how is rainwater caught? Does it run directly into the river right now? Yes, it does. That's what the state, that's what the, okay. Um, you're, you're asking the current parking yeah. uh, lot where the storm water is going right, I'm to. I'm talking about all of Lowell Street uh, and Middle Street. Like, where does that where does that drain out to? And if, does that does that auto, like we have OC uh, catchments uh, behind uh, the the Hampton Inn, for instance, that hold like. I don't know, but we can look at the city GIS and see. Well, we can, we can come back to that too. For stormwater, actually, everything does, and there is an outfall. This there is an easement that the city retained as part of the discontinuation. It's the really kind of light line here, but that's actually a, a very large uh, outfall pipe that goes through there. I believe it's about 42 inches. It's it's a it's a pretty rugged pipe there. Um, so that's where our our storm drain connects into from the from the site itself too. Okay, yep. and I guess the second point that I would just make is that. I, I, I live in that area, so I drive mm -hmm. through that section all the time. Right now, primarily um, where this site is being proposed is, is parking that um, some Dempsey Center people use, but it's mostly the, the nursing school. Um, and the DHHS parking lot, the whole back end of that is always empty. Um, it, is a private, it is a private space, but I'm just saying that like right now the pressures that are in that neighborhood as far as like even if 150 units were, were to go in there, nobody else is in that space. That, like it's it's underutilized, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's a sea is. of pavement from above, right? And it's yeah, 100 percent a sea of pavement from above. A lot of it, which is not being taxed. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Josh, just to highlight it, the pink there is the storm sewer system, so you can see that it does look like it's outfalling to the. Um, yeah, it's all going into the river. Yep. 
Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board members? You have one. Okay. We'll go to staff then. Um, okay. So um, I had sort of made a general comment in one of my um, comments to the applicants about making sure that mechanicals on the building are screened and none of the elevations show any mechanicals on top of the building. Nick, will there be any? Yeah, that's a good question. If there's any on the roof, it'll be screened either by the, the parapet or by additional screening. Um, but there's, there's a lot of change in the kind of mechanical attachments to building nowadays, a lot of places going all electric, so it may just be vented exteriorly from the exterior wall, so. But yes, the plan will be that anything will be screened. Okay, um, and then there are, is, there are some uh, shrubs shown, but as far as screening the transformer, is there any way we can screen that better for um, people walking by? Yes, we can certainly, we can certainly push that pad back, uh, and those two black dots there are, are some ballers just for uh, protection from vehicles, so we can certainly make make some more uh, efforts to to move around some of those uh, those plantings there. Okay, that's great. Um, and then there was a comment I'd made about the canopies, um, and I had, on Friday I had listed kind of the sections of code. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, Nick. Yes. Um, so there are some requirements for canopies. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, so like there's a minimum of eight feet high from the pavement clearance and a few other things. So I just want to make sure you were looking at that. I didn't know if you guys were planning on addressing those comments from Friday at all. Um, they're fairly minor in nature, but I, I just didn't know um, yeah, what your plan was of that. No, thank you. The canopies <clears throat> will be over eight feet, um, and uh, they won't be within two feet of the curb. Um, so yes, we, we plan to meet all here of section five. Okay, okay. that's um, great. Okay, fantastic. All right, any um, other questions and then, or comments? Well, sorry, Oops, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so I just want to make sure when, when we get kind of back, I think we sort of sidetracked Nick's presentation a little bit here. When we get back to that, um, if the applicant can be clear if they're still asking for the waiver to plantings in the right of way or not, um, that would be helpful. Um, and then there also was a comment um, for the uh, architect, um, their narrative that addresses the um, context sensitive design staff was looking for them to kind of spell out a few things on that um, so I don't know if the board wants that done that that particular one I did make as a condition of approval so, um, so that's already encompassed in that but is some of what you just for our sake Shelley in knowing our purview and how to support um, efficiencies and moving this process along both mm -hmm. for you and staff as well as for the applicant is most of what you just referenced things that you would be monitoring through the next stages of development? Um, or are they items that we need to hear the answers to to make? Um, there like are items that I think we need the applicant to address because if we have signed plans that don't address those, uh, there's really no recourse for us to require it. Um, there could be a, a more general comment made that like um, conditions like my comments from Friday are addressed to staff satisfaction, something like that. So we could kind of wrap it into that. Um, and then the, the issue with the uh, design standards and the narrative they provided, which was somewhat incomplete, that's really more of a legal issue. So staff's concern is that if this decision that the board makes was challenged, we want to make sure that we have a really clear record and the record is typically the applicant's written um, materials that they put together, which is why we look for it to be very clear how they've met each of the criteria and have it stated. So that's, that's really kind of what we're looking for. Um, but uh, yeah. So. And I'm happy to, I think it was just a context sensible design. We had given a general narrative trying to cover all those points. So I think it was just asked to give a written description on each one, um, which we're happy to do and have started. I, I can verbally go through them now if it's helpful as well, but they're a little bit, right, they're not as clear cut as, you know, no 15 foot openings. It's, you know, does the height of the building fit with the nature of the neighborhood? So they're, um, you know, a little, little bit ambiguous, but I'm happy to talk through them or just, you know, again, we will submit the writing as well. 
What is the language that we could add as a number nine, Shelley, that um, provides the opportunity for the applicant to give you satisfactory written responses and sure. to make that a condition of approval that allows the process to move forward and you the time to have a reviewed document that you feel good about submitting instead of trying to walk us through it verbally tonight? Um, so I think there were some questions that came up tonight. Um, and I guess that's a question for the board is, is whether you want the applicant to come back to address um, some, uh, you know, anything related to trash cans, the canopy criteria, anything related to pedestrian spaces, um, and the other items that we've been discussing. Um, Can, could we say something to the effect that um, you know, the applicant will provide uh, materials to address the concerns that the board had tonight to the satisfaction of staff? You could. I think what I would ask for is maybe separate from a motion to that. There's discussion from the board where it's, we have a clear list of what that is um, so that it's. I don't believe it was the board that brought up canopies, candidly. Yeah, you right. brought up the canopy. So it sounds like you have a list of things that might be unresolved from the time the packets went out, and that even though we have an updated document, there's some items that don't feel quite finite. I'm satisfied with what I've heard here tonight and would like to ensure that you are so that you and the applicant can move forward, mm -hmm. but I'd like to do that in an action this evening. Okay. Um, so I think we could have a condition of approval that prior to the signing of the drawings, um, staff's comments dated August 11th are... Uh, satisfied as well as any screening that's required for mechanicals something like that okay yeah, yeah I, I really would you know it, it we've had things that have wanted and nothing that we've talked about tonight is something that I am that I wouldn't entrust to staff or that I'm concerned to hear in a second presentation correct I agree yeah I, I agree with uh, with Shanna so are we ready for a motion well, I don't think we've talked fully about the waiver requests. You still had an outstanding because there was still um, the clarification on the right of way request describe. being a waiver. Yeah, and clarification if they still want that waiver. Yep. The waiver on the right of way. Yeah. So for planting trees in the right of way, they're no longer doing that on Lowell ah. Street. Um, but I think that it's still in the materials that they're asking for a waiver. So just want the clarification from the applicant whether they would like that waiver potentially for future. You know, I guess my concern is if they need to do more work than what they're doing to do the repavement and their ta and talk with Public Works, are they going to decide to put street trees in? I, I don't know. So I guess that's really for the applicant to decide if like they're satisfied that this is exactly what they're doing and they won't be doing additional street trees, then they don't need the waiver. They don't need a waiver if they're going to do what they're what. They're showing what they're, on that what they're plan. showing right on that plan, yeah. So if they're satisfied that that's what they need, then they really don't need the waiver. But okay. if the board wanted to give them a waiver in case they, you know what I mean? I wouldn't I hate to have to them respond. come back okay. to need so, a waiver. Let, let, I, so. I think it's safe to say at the moment we're, we're okay with, with removing that waiver request. Okay, okay. fantastic. Would that change so, any of our conditions this evening? Uh, no. Okay. So it's just for the public Okay, record. so that's that's it? You, those are your concerns, uh, Shelley? Yes. Okay. So just to make sure, though, that the board has discussed the waiver request. So you discussed the um, entrance frequency. You discussed the 21 inch of the building and the yep. 60 inches of the window. Um, and then the amenity space, I think, was touched on. Mm -hmm. um, just to make sure. I think those were all the. Yeah, yeah we did full, discuss it. The full um, number of clarifying amenity. question, though. Yep. Yeah. On the second waiver request, our discussion reflected that the actual request is a waiver for a variance of zero to 21 inches, and that doesn't actually put it at 21 inches from ground level. Did I understand you correctly? Or are you looking for a waiver that allows the first floor window to be as low as 21 inches from the ground? I heard you say you were looking for a variance of the 60 inch to up to 21 inches. It would be both, actually. There, there would be the zero to 21 was for just the finished floor elevation in each of those residential units to be within 21 inches of that exterior grade. And then there is the, the window portion of that as well. Does the way this is worded address both of those, Shelley? Um, they haven't asked for the 60 inch window one, um, but the 
other one was requested, so if they're requesting it tonight and the board's okay with both of those waivers, you could move forward with that. I don't think we have any um, conditions of approval that are related to the waiver, do we? None jumped out at me. No, no, no. no. So, I, so I think it's just a matter of you have a, um, a motion that you would take as a board that you uh, are, are okay with the waivers requested. Maybe that motion, you would amend it to say they're also asking for the, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's the thing is to amend that motion to specify so it's clear that the application has been amended, that um, they're no longer asking for a waiver for planting in the right of way, and they are additionally asking for a waiver um, from the 60 inch height for the windows in the residential first floor. And I, th I think if it makes it any easier, I believe one of the requests was to, to submit revised kind of narrative materials um, since there was quite a bit of back and forth uh, with staff. So that can be additionally reflected and, and added into our final package that we submit for staff. Sounds, sounds good. All right. To me, good. I will entertain a motion. Uh, I'd like to ask just for clarifying purposes for Shelley first. I think that you did this for us, and so I appreciate it. But in the second motion listed as actions necessary in your revised packet tonight, it is only the second motion that needs one through eight listed out, as well as the conditions, and that the waiver would have some clarifying language, but I do not need to read one through eight slash nine. No, for the, the second right. motion, for the first motion. Correct. Great. Okay. Shall we? Shall we? Endeavor. Endeavor. Let's let's <clears throat> go for it. Sure. Uh, I would like to begin by making a motion that the application submitted by AGN Development. Did I get that right? AGN. AGN. Thanks. Like the C. Sorry. Um, LLC for the construction of a 17,982 square foot apartment building with 150 dwelling units at 55 Middle Street meets all of the necessary criteria, criteria contained in Article 11, Section 24.5H waiver request and Article 13, Section 8.1A, and that their waiver request be granted reflecting request one and two in tonight's packet, the removal of request three and the additional uh, waiver being granted for a variance of the 60 inch external height in the residential windows. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Roger. Any further discussion of the board? I'll call the roll. Roger Dupree. Yes. Joshua Najeen. Yes. Michael Marcotte. Yes. Shanna Cox. Yes. Christine Kittredge. Yes. Alex Pine. Yes. Lucy Bisson. Yes. Second motion. Let's do it. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that the application submitted by AGN Development, thanks, LLC for the construction of a 17,982 square foot apartment building with 150 dwelling units at 55 Middle Street meets all of the necessary criteria contained in the Zoning and Land Use Code, including but not limited to Article 13, Section 4, Approval Criteria, and Section 5, Coordination with State Subdivision Law, and that development and subdivision approval be granted with the following conditions. Prior to signing the final drawings, the applicant will work with Public Works to determine if any work in the right-of-way is required and to develop a design for this area if needed. Prior to signing the final drawings, the applicant will submit the narrative addressing the design district overlay district standards that addresses the review criteria and that staff will either confirm the project meets the standards or refer the project back to the planning board if standards are not met or is unclear. Can you pause the note-taking for a second? Does that not address our condition nine that we were gonna add? Um, it certainly addresses the design district issues. Um, so I think num uh, we'll still add on a nine for all comments not related to design district standards. Yeah. That, that sounds well. great. So yeah. right. That way we'll cover ourselves. We'll resume for the notes. Prior to the signing of the final drawings, a revised subdivision plat be submitted that is stamped by a licensed land surveyor. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, proof of financial capacity will be provided. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, a deed restriction or other legal agreement acceptable to the city be placed on the parking garage property that ensures that the required parking for the apartment building is available regardless of ownership. That prior to the issuance of a building permit, an easement over city land to access the north side of the parking garage be proposed and be approved by city council and recorded. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, capacity to serve for both water and sewer be received from public works. 
Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant's engineer shall certify that all improvements have been completed in accordance with the approved plans, including but not limited to utilities, pavements and plantings, and building exterior materials. Prior to the issuance, uh, do you care what issuance? Building permit. Probably. Thanks. Prior to the issuance of the building permit? Well, it's just signing of the drawings because it might impact what's on the drawings. Thank you. Prior Thank to the you. signing of the document, staff comments dated from August 11th, 2023 will be satisfied to staff's discernment. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Roger. Any further discussion? Roger Dupree. Yes. Joshua Najeen. Yes. Michael Marcotte. Yes. Shanna Cox. Yes. Christine Kittridge. Yes. Alex Pine. Yes. Lucy Bisson. Yes. Happy building. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. See you again. Yeah. Looking forward to the start of this and looking forward to seeing you guys again. And again. And again. Yeah. Can I, can, I just <coughs> can I make a comment at all about, like, after that's been closed? About this particular subject? Yeah, after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when we get to uh, other business. Other business. Okay. We are going to be in other business, but let's do the, the other business business first, yeah, and then yeah, we'll. The first other business. Yeah, the first other business, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll yeah. give you some other business. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Other business, the planning board initiating ordinance changes to Appendix A, Zoning and Land Use Code, Article 15, Significant Buildings and Districts in response to recommendations from the Historic Preservation Review Board. Craig, you're up. We've got, uh, we've got two, um, two proposals from the Historic Preservation Board. Uh, the first is to change some of the language uh, from historical value to uh, historical significance. And that's uh, mostly just in the definition section. The, uh, the larger sort of change that we were looking at uh, was a few sort of a few months in the work that we've been discussing. Um, this is clarifying some language regarding when staff or when, you know, just in general, we need to review signs for certificates of appropriateness. Uh, the previous language was a little unclear. There were two separate references to this that required signs to be reviewed when they were, um, when they were within an historic district um, as a contributing structure within a historic district. And then there was another reference for basically any building in a historic district. So one was a little broader and uh, through some of the discussions with historic preservation, they determined that um, it's more in line with their, you know, the image or the sort of consistency to, um, to regulate all signs, just all signs within the historic district, whether they are on a contributing structure or not, about the, you know, the important focus on the uh, aesthetics of the, of the um, district in general. So those are the changes that are reflected in the, uh, in the draft language. Uh, specifically, I would direct you to section five, certificates of appropriateness. We added uh, number five on um, C5, the underlying language. Signage when located on a historic structure or in a designated historic district on land or buildings when visible from a public right of way, uh, except for signs that do not require a sign permit. That's the, the, main, the main change that we're looking at um, and happy to answer any questions. Okay, I have one comment. Um, statement of purpose and definitions B, the second paragraph, the last the last line of the second paragraph, such as paint, you need to put a period there. Oh, yeah. We'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mm. Shanna, you have questions? <clears throat> I appreciate the clarification, and I like the move from value to significance. Um, when we're looking at Section 5C and the addition of 5 and the language clarity in 1, this isn't 
adding new buildings, new things into the purview of the historical review board, it's just separating out architectural features from signage. That's just, that's a question, question mark. Oh. Right? <laughs> like, um, um, they yeah. already have the ability to review signage regardless of the historical building if it's in a historical district. And this does not see in Shelley's, yeah, that's what I'm curious about. Shelley's nodding no. Um, because it feels like this expands their purview it in does. a way, yeah. <clears throat> Can we get clarity on that? So, um, I don't know if you want to talk about it because we had a lot of discussion with the it, board and they asked for what other municipalities do and so we um, talked to state the state and they called some folks and we talked to people and it was a mixed bag some communities don't regulate signs at all and with historic districts some regulate all the signs some only regulate those on the buildings it was kind of mixed um, the discussion was you know the the if you have a historic building, so let's think Lisbon Street, that's probably our, our most iconic historic district that's we're Could most we see a district with. to help this conversation? Yes, we can absolutely do that. Um, and I can make that happen while I chat. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and that's actually a great point, Shanna. Like when we pull this up, you'll see that there's a lot of buildings on Lisbon Street that aren't considered historic but are in the historic district. And so the thought was, well, if I can have a certain type of sign on my building, but you have to have a certain different type of sign, how are we maintaining a consistent look in the historic district? It, um, and does that feel important is an important follow-on question. Right. And, and for the Historic um, Preservation Review Board, the discussions we had with them, it, it did feel important. Um, that may not be the case for this board or for others. Uh, let me just find the historic stuff here. Okay. Is there a specific spot you want to look, or is Lisbon good? So if we, uh, I'd be curious, uh, I'd love for you to zoom out and for us to see how many historic districts are within city limits. Is it largely just downtown? Is there other? It's largely downtown, and what I will say is I actually need to get. Yeah. Yeah. I need to. Um, get street. Jim Ward to update it because actually the Fry district is not listed as a historic district here you're not seeing the magenta but it actually is that one's missing um, but these ones are shown and so if I switch this around because right now you're not seeing the um, you're not seeing the building so if you just kind of notice that all of this area is in pink and then if I take the districts away you can see that there's, um, if we zoom in a bit more, a number of buildings that aren't considered historic that are within So the red district. ones are historic? That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, or contributing structures, right. which currently are regulated as well for signs. So, um, so there's a number of buildings that wouldn't be, that are in the historic district. So all, just to put it another way, all of the buildings that are not red, that are overlaid with the magenta would become in the purview for signs. With this change. That's right. Yeah, if they wanted signs. Okay. So. Okay. And do they have standards or criteria that's guiding their They do. Review? So there's actually the Secretary of State, sorry, the Secretary of State has review criteria and we have a document from it's the 80s or early 90s that Lewiston has put together that has that criteria in it. There's um, text, so like not having font that's like Old English or some weird like non-normal font for us here. Um, having uh, materials that seem appropriate that will resist weather, um, affixing it to the building in a way that's sensitive to the facade of the building and won't damage the building. Color, which is a little weird, but um, they tend to be, we, we tend to be fairly flexible with color, um, but there are some standards for that. So, and I'm missing something, but Craig does like all those staff reviews. They, so uh, they really don't like backlit signs. Yeah, so the current standard is that the light has to like be on the sign, not be like an internally lit sign. So, okay. um, and we've actually talked about looking at redoing those standards or updating it. Um, 
but in that whole document because it is fairly old but it there was a lot of effort put into it like it's certainly very good and it has a lot of examples from Lewiston it's it's quite local um in its um you know focus um but yeah that is a thought to, to maybe update that at some point yeah probably not a bad idea yeah. Josh so I, I just have a well I have a slew of questions but um Ultimately, already, uh, the Historic Review Board decides what you can and cannot do with a building that is a historic building or a contributing structure, right? And now we're, we're suggesting that we're going to ex extend the purview for signage to any building that sits within a historic uh, district. That, that's correct. Okay, so including all of the empty ones? All of the empty ones, any, any building, any... Um any land actually now and has there been any discussion with any of the business owners downtown at this point um, that that's one question that I have and then the second question is um, because the S historic review board actually has the power to actually override the planning board um, it, when when we grant them powers um, and so the question would be um, and, and this is my concern um, I drive down Lisbon Street all the time there are multiple <laughs> signs for closed businesses still up, right? Um, mm -hmm. The last thing I'm concerned about is whether or not a new business's sign matches mm -hmm. another business that opened 40 years ago. Um, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm thinking about like just how we regulate how it looks today mm -hmm. with businesses that say now open that aren't um, and businesses that aren't there. Um, and, and why would we put a, a further impediment for signage uh, to somebody who doesn't own a historic building. I, I guess that's my question. And, and the, the logic behind that was because the Historic Review Board wanted to have conformity on, in the historic districts. Was that the, with signage specifically? Yeah, and actually at staff's recommendation too, because we felt like otherwise, what, why is there a historic district, right? I mean, it felt like there, there should be some visual consistency from something so obvious like signs from building to building, um, you know, instead of kind of specifically regulating individual signs. But um, if that's something that you'd like to discuss, so what happened was um, we've been discussing this for a number of months and, and the board's gone back and forth on this and, and really thought about it. Um, we had such a light agenda that I said, okay, I'm gonna throw this on for you guys to initiate. And I let the, um, the chairman of the Historic Preservation Review Board know I was doing that and said, if there was a request from the board or if you wanted more discussion that we could schedule the public hearing and that meeting where you would be taking action potentially um, at a time when he could come and certainly other members could come if you wanted to discuss that with them. So we could certainly make that available um, if there is an interest in kind of talking a little bit more about this essentially expansion of review that would be happening with this change. My, my only concern is just like, you know, encouraging conformity as opposed to regulating it, mm -hmm. I think creates more of a model that is collaborative. Um, mm -hmm. And whether or not that comes from COA or the city, I don't think that um, um, I don't think that it necessarily has to be something that the historic district oversees. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that, that's just my take. The other thing staff could do, um, we'd be happy to pull together that review criteria that's used when we look at signs and, and give that to you for the next go around with us as well. Okay, if that would help. Shanna, I can't support this as written tonight without additional information and public comment. That's going to be really important. I speak to businesses regularly. Signage is always the biggest expense. It is currently with code enforcement on a non-historic building already a point of tension around both meeting their marketing needs in a way that helps them be seen on a on a, on a road that's one way um, and a number of other things mm -hmm. and then there's it's one of the largest expenses that business owners face particularly if they're fitting out an existing building and when you pull up the difference between existing lots versus what would be covered questions that I have that would need to be answered and that the public would need to hear so that we could feel confident when business owners, potential business owners, commercial developers sit in front of this space is can we be clear about what standards are being applied so that somebody who's looking to invest, rehab, and open a commercial space knows exactly 
what they're getting into, including your color choices, mm -hmm. um, because that's it's it's it is fundamentally an important point. And if the desire, which I don't hold, but I can understand and respect others do, if the desire is for conformity by the eye, both by pedestrian or automobile traffic down Lisbon Street, because it is largely that is for conformity, um, I would question that. And then I would look for us to be a little more clear about what kind of conformity we're looking for because part of the joy of Lisbon Street is the ability to see the evolution over years, the way in which things have changed, um, and that both uh, dated signage and current signage reflects that redevelopment and reinvestment. And um, uniformity, <laughs> uh, and not just Conformity concerns me mm -hmm. uh, about that. And I think it will, as we look, it, this move is counterintuitive to many other conversations this board has had with council about being business friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that you, they can't regulate signage. It's being clear before we give blanket privileges to an entire district. Is it, how far back does it cover? Is it a sign update then follows the new one? Is it any new sign that's added? What is the signage requirements? That Those are all really fundamentally important things when you think about the depth in which we've had conversations about the design standards and the way in which we've worked with developers and businesses to hear their concerns and the nature of not knowing what that looks like, what that commitment is, not providing a public comment period, and frankly, not hearing city council's opinion makes me a little nervous about just being like, great changes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there could be some really positive moves here. I, there's just not enough information or clarity or public process for me to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Alex? What other requirements are placed on building owners who own non uh, historic registered structures within the historic district? What other things do they have to be reviewed for? Well, I think you just know, that we moment. could probably you know, discuss it at a later time because I, I don't, I agree yeah. with Shannon. Yeah. And, and uh, Josh, I, I can't support this because I don't really think that I want to give the Historical Previ I'll, I'll Preservation just Board. I'll amend my comment to if we could have that for our next time we discuss this matter. Right, absolutely. I, I can pull it up pretty quickly, Christine, though. Christine, you had um, some comments? No. <laughs> we, could act on the, we could act on the first item. Like, so. we could agree to the changes in the definition sections. No, all I think do, we should All you're just, doing is initiating yeah. changes. It's just right, initiating. To Article 15. I think we want to So you wait. wouldn't really be doing picking out and choosing. Mike, that. you had some questions? Uh, um, I had a question, but maybe it's just a question to be answered at that later date. <clears throat> uh, how does the Unita Biscuit uh, sign fall into this complete mix? I mean, that's an existing sign that's just... That's forever old. I mean, if they wanted to remove it, um, yeah, they could. Could they, could, but, could they yeah. remove it? Uh, paint over it with paint over pink it. bubble gum drops. <laughs> well, paint, paint is a whole other issue because you can't paint a brick building if it's not painted already. Okay. I, All right. I, I'd just like um, if it's a historic building. I'd like to hear some so, discussion about it. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I, I think we need to, to So if I can just um, table answer this. one question <laughs> while we're going there. Um, so a certificate of appropriateness is required for new construction of a principal or accessory building or structure where the building is located in a designated historic district. That's the only time when a non-designated building is regulated by the historic review currently. Um, so, that, so if you're building a new building or an addition and it's not a historic building but you're in the district, then you need to, to have approval. Um, for an existing building, if it's um, not historic, then, then there aren't um, typically regulations. Um, and I will say, if it's also helpful to the board, we can provide a list of signs that have had historic review approval that you could go look at. Like Rusty Bus is a good example. Yeah. The Blue Jay Cafe is a good example. Um, the LA Art sign, when they get it up, was one where we actually did have a concern as staff that their color was an extremely bright yellow. And so we referred it to the Historic Preservation Review Board. Staff didn't feel that they could confidently say this color meets the color requirements. Um, so we referred it to the board and then they did end up approving it. But what they did was the applicant toned the yellow down a little and they were very happy to do that. It's so. also a 
a backlit sign, if I remember. Oh, it was also backlit. That's right. And so that was why we had sent it to them. So there's some elements where staff can just approve the sign. And so we do that pretty quickly. I mean, staff, uh, Craig has probably done eight or 10 staff approval of signs in the last year. Yeah, generally um, what happens is... Occasionally it goes to the board, mm -hmm. so the signs. Yeah. And just yes, Josh. With that, I'm just thinking about... So when you mentioned Blue Jay Coffee, uh, I was involved in, in the mural that went on, uh, the Blue Jay mural that went up, and that's a, the interior wall of a supporting structure. And the process in which to get it past uh, David, because he considered it to be a sign at the time, um, and uh, the, the historic uh, review board was intense. Um, and then Blue Jay Coffee opened. <laughs> do, you, do you see what I'm saying? So it's like it's yeah. like a thing where, like, I'm not saying Blue Jay Coffee opened up because there's a Blue Jay there, but I am saying that like it probably had something to do with what they decided to name, name the them. shop, sure. and it actually makes usable uh, for retail a whole block. So, right. Right. You know, it's just one of those things that like w w when we talk about historic review, we just need to really consider like what we want to accomplish versus what we want to regulate. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, and I'm going to keep yeah. it short, if you have a non-historic building in a district, like you could paint it hot pink, but as soon as you want to put a new sign on it with this, it would have to go through review and be historically appropriate on your hot pink building. If it's a, yes, yep. Yeah, and that's, that's yeah. stupid. So <laughs> let's, let's table this and can you, you know, give us the, more information, the the reg, you know, the regulations that they yeah, using. We have to move to just yeah, that table sheet. it. That's uh, all okay, so we don't have to table it. We or anything. We're we're, we're, just, we're not moving to initiate. Well, the so request, what do you want us to do? The request is to initiate changes to Article 15. Um, this is draft language, so certainly my suggestion would be that you initiate it so that we can kind of continue the discussion about content and if you want different content it would be like any time i come to you with ordinance changes okay. and you guys make changes to it um you okay. know i think the difference here is that we would probably make sure we had um anyone from the Historic Preservation Review Board that wanted to at that meeting. It's a public hearing. They could speak. If you had specific questions for them, there could be a little dialogue. Okay. All right. So, all right. So we need an action. We need a motion to initiate the code amendments. So I will entertain a motion unless people want to keep talking. I'd like to make a motion to initiate code amendments summarized in this memo pursuant to Article 7, Section 4 and Article 17, Amendments, Section 5. Looking forward to the public process. Yes. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, Alex, a second. Any further discussion? Roger. Yes. Joshua. Yes. Michael Marcotte. Abstain. Okay. Shanna Cox. Uh, yes. Christine Kittredge. Yes. And Alex Pine. Yes. Lucy Bisson. Yes. So that's. I don't know. However, we've got one abstention. <laughs> Can I make we a comment it. before we move on? Yeah, Chair? absolutely. Um, It'd be really helpful to see what the standards are that would be applied to all, like that, in, in terms of both for the public comment and for our own, as you initiate it, and I know you took some notes, but being able to bring us that information in the packet for that agenda item would be really helpful. Sure, yep, and, and the standards for what they use are in Article 15 as well. But, okay, but, we but if you can supply that. us though, that information in the packet, that would be yep. fantastic. Yeah. Josh, did you have other comments to do for other business? Yeah, I just wanted to mention just real quick, when we're talking about the, the, the development project that Aegean has brought before us, there's a really big opportunity to find out exactly what our leverage is with Brookfield, CMP, the FERC relicensing, and also considering the fact that there's a lot of, there's, there's going to be a lot of investment from the developer. There's probably going to be some investment from us. Um, and so it would be great if we could, if we could kitty corner any of those pieces together in order to get more investment in, in order to make this space, mm -hmm. um, you know, something that, that 
is a larger project. And so like one of the things I thought about with the OC catchment, like I was really surprised that there is no, there, there is no, um, there is no water diversion there. It all runs right, in, mm -hmm. right, right into the river right now. And thinking about the fact that there's been a huge fight to change uh, sections of the river to class B, which makes it actually more of a recreational river. Like maybe that's something we could work on in this space if, that, if we have leverage for that. When the FERC relicensing closes, we will not be able to renegotiate with Brookfield for 50 years. Um, and so, you know. It's yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. It's no, I, I didn't, I don't object. I, I just, it didn't, uh, uh, I, I, it wasn't uh, appropriate to discuss it because it had nothing to do with their, uh, their project. And that's why I wanted it to be separate. That's all. No, but, no, I completely No, I think it. the discussion is, is good. I'm. I, I really think, yeah, if, you, if we're not going to be able to talk to them for 50 years, I think it's something that we should And, and the same thing with up. CMP, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're developing the, the transformer line yep. here. They're going to be a bit bigger partner. Is there, I mean, like when we talk about mm -hmm. a $200,000 uh, development, it's like a rounding error for a company. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. Michael, did you have some question? Or some uh, yeah, just to piggyback what uh, Josh said, <clears throat> all too often over the decades, uh, projects get approved and we find out later that we handcuffed ourselves mm -hmm. in the process. That's what I think Josh is alluding to. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my concern in a large way. So when the topics were coming up about uh, uh, the uh, stormwater um, uh, and, and anything else with respect to this property, uh, the, the, river, uh, the riverfront. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, trail, tra the trail. The trail. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. It may not be part of this project, but if we're amiss in not addressing it ahead of the project, then we're stuck with it. And I just learned something tonight. 50 years with Brookfield. I just. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the case with the realized. That's beyond any of most of our lifetimes. Oh, it is. yeah. Yeah, and what I will maybe, say with that. Maybe is not Alex, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Alex and Christine, I think, are. I don't want to be 93. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I will say too with that that unfortunately the whatever the federal arm is that handles the relicensing denied the request that was made by Lewiston, Auburn, and a number of organizations in the area to have a more um, involved relicensing process, mm -hmm. and they provide they opted for the more streamlined approach, which provides for less public input. So um, that being said, uh, there. Are are some things coming up that I know will be happening. There'll be a site walk with, with Brookfield and with staff to look at some things. Like I know the city is asking for things, but I also um, know that there are uh, also some studies and things that the timeline on those is still quite far out. So I think it's a while before we'll know kind of where things land, but I'd be happy to ask um, Director Hedegar to bring a memo or something to the board with the status on where things are with the relicensing process because I think that would be a great thing for you to be updated on. Okay. Um, so, All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's good. Okay. Um, Alex? Specifically, sort of, again, to what Josh is saying, when we're looking at projects like this, I know they only came to us with one building, but they have intent for three more. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically like a third of this sort of mini neighborhood here. Mm -hmm. And it's significantly changing the urban form. And I think, like, looking at it from a plan perspective, when you're talking, you know, even though it's an individual product, looking at it from a plan perspective, I don't know what our process would be for doing that, but I think it's something we should consider because we are starting to see just rapid redevelopment, and that's great, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that it meets our plan mm -hmm. and that we support the developer in that. Yeah, absolutely. Shannon? Well, I'm going to talk about something different, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, do you know when we will revisit the Article 2 definitions for restaurants and drinking places that was tabled July 10th? Uh, we will have that as a joint discussion on the September 12th meeting with the council. Great. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay, so reading of the minutes, we're going to uh, postpone that because we got them at the last minute, and we'll, uh, they're quite lengthy, and I read some of them already online, and, and I have some uh Changes that have to be edits. Edits, yeah. They're, just, they're you know, they're, they're punctuation. Punctuation. There's a <laughs> there's a sentence there. I should say there's a phrase there that's really not a sentence. There's you know, it doesn't say anything, and uh, you know, stuff like that. So uh, I will be sending those out, um, and I think that you know, we'll wait till the next meeting, 
And um, if there are no other comments and questions, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. I would like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay, he's already said Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and all Let the record favor, reflect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so our next meeting is? 28th. Do you think that one's going to stick? The 28th. Um, we will know after tomorrow night's council meeting if the meeting on the 28th or not. It might be canceled. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, we'll keep our fingers Thank crossed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> comment about the period missing in there. Oh. It was actually there. They well, did not delete the period at the end of the I sentence. I know. But <laughs>